<clears throat> hey folks, my name is John. I'm a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz and one of the co-founders of um, Games Fund One, which is Andreessen's uh, first dedicated fund uh, dedicated to investing in gaming founders. Um, and I'm joined here by Cordell. Would you, can you introduce yourself? Absolutely. I'm Cordell Robin Coker. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Carry First, and we're Africa's leading mobile publisher and uh, consumer fintech platform. Our mission is to scale awesome content in the region by solving hard problems. That's awesome. So let's, let's start off by actually talking about Africa, which is, I think, the hot topic of our um, talk today. Um, but tell us a bit about what are some of the major trends that we should think about when, when, we, when we think about Africa. Um, you know, what's happening now and why is it exciting? Yeah, so Africa is a really fascinating gaming market. Um, I would say it's underpinned by the best demographics in the world. So you have 1.4 billion people, over a billion of them under the age of 40, which is more than the US and China combined. Um, on the content side, it's almost entirely mobile. Um, and so over 90% of internet access is via the mobile phone. And so we have 300 million unique gamers, a billion dollar market, which should double in the next wow. few years. Um, so we, we think it's a really exciting market and, and an exciting time as well. Yeah. And a statistic I think that you've, um, I've heard you quote that I love is that um, Africa is one of the fastest growing mobile gaming markets in the world today, right? Um, Maybe you could talk a bit about why that's, that's coming to pass? Okay. Yeah, over the last 10 years, um, the number of unique gamers has grown by 3x, and uh, the market overall has grown by 7x. Um, there are a bunch of reasons. The first is just penetration. So smartphone adoption uh, is growing double digits year over year. So more people have phones in their pockets. Right. And just like everywhere in the world, when people get their first smartphone, they basically they want to chat with their friends, right. they want to find dates, and they want to play games. And so gaming being, uh, I think, one of the most ubiquitous forms of media, um, we see that really, really taking off. Um, so that's the good side. Um, there's a lot of really kind of mm -hmm. strong demographic trends, but there are also some challenges. So we think the market could grow even much faster um, if, if there were some, some things that were solved. Yeah. So I think it's fascinating if I can just draw a bit from my personal history. So I used to work at Tencent before I um, came to A16Z. And one of the things that also happened there was that mobile gaming just really took off in a huge way. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of it was contributed by sort of the console ban that China had where um, a whole generation of gamers basically skipped playing console games and then they went straight to basically like, you know, playing games in the one device that everyone had at the time, which was like, you know, the, the feature phones and later on the swipe phones. Um, and then the WeChat ecosystem paired up a fintech platform ended up being the home for a lot of some of the biggest games in China. So. Yeah, 100%. I think in our, in our wildest dreams, we, we hope to be the Tencent of Africa. <laughs> um, and we, we see very similar trends. Um, instead of a console ban, we just haven't had a console or a PC market. Um, if you think about mobile, it really democratizes gaming. Um, because everyone has one in their pocket, it's relatively inexpensive, and, um, and suddenly now everyone's a gamer, even if you can't afford a you know, $1,000 PS5 right. or, a, right. or a couple thousand dollar P, uh, like PC. So. Yeah. And um, I think one of the questions that uh, I used to get a lot when I was working for Tencent is just, are the types of games that people play in China, are they fundamentally different from the rest of the world? So if you're a game developer, like, can your games even translate to China? And so I'd be really curious you know, what, what your view on that answer is for, um, for Africa specifically. You know, how do you account for regional taste, and is it different from the rest of the world, and, and so on? I would say f fundamentally it's not different. And we, we honestly had to learn that ourselves the hard way. Mm -hmm. We started out as a studio. We thought you needed to build like hyper-culturalized content by country. And we realized eventually that our users just wanted to play the best games in the world. So yep. they wanted to play Call of Duty and Candy Crush. And, um, and the question was around accessibility. And so um, the only differences we see between, let's say, specific markets in Africa and Western markets can be explained 
constrained by demographics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the median age on the continent is 19 years old, hmm. uh, which compares wow. to like 43 in Western Europe. So it's really young. And then uh, smartphone penetration skews male. Mm -hmm. So if I think about our like our, like archetype, it's like a 19-year-old mm -hmm. college male, right. and you, and if you look at games that they play, they tend to be competitive, um, and they tend to be you know multiplayer, and so we there are a few themes we tend to focus on, so sports games, mobile first sports, mm -hmm. um, lightweight shooters. Um, mm. Unfortunately, we like to shoot our friends, um, <laughs> and it's a universal human <laughs> human behavior. <laughs> Exactly. Um, and parlor games. So if you think about the games that you play with your friends offline on a Friday, maybe with a whiskey or a beer, um, card games, dice, board games. And so bringing those to mobile in an accessible way um, is really uh, what we focus on. But um, we don't, you know, Africans don't need their own content, which is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And as, as a game developer, um, I feel like there must be several in the audience today. If you have a successful game and you're thinking about bringing it to Africa, like what, is, what are some of the things that they should be thinking about? The, the first thing is accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we've learned is that you know, there's, there's technical churn and there's content churn. Content churn, everyone deals with. At some point, you get bored uh, or your game is not you know, interesting enough. You run out of content and they move on. Technical churn is more avoidable. Um, that's like game doesn't work well on the device. There are high crash rates or ANRs, um, or it's really, really resource intensive. So, um, you know, when we think about Western developers today, oftentimes they're always they're building for the latest iPhone device, mm -hmm. which is more powerful than my laptop was five mm -hmm. years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're thinking about environments where you have 5G connections and everything works great, and synchronicity is really easy. But for like a couple billion users across frontier markets, including Africa, they're, they're on a $100 Android smartphone mm -hmm. with limited storage, limited processing capacity. Mm -hmm. um, they're paying for airtime out of pocket, prepaid. Right. And that's like right. a very real material expense for them. And so the first thing I would think about is, how do you make sure your game is accessible? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, relatively light on device, not a ton of, um, you know, requirements, and, and just playable. And, and just to double click on accessibility, so <clears throat> if you just put your game on the App Store or Google Play, for, that doesn't quite, it's not quite accessible for anyone <laughs> on the continent, right? For, for the reasons that you mentioned, device compatibility and you know, other things. So. It's, it's, it's not. Um, and so we get this a lot. They're like, well, I can put my, you know, game in the App Store, like yeah. in Africa, like what's the difference? Why do you need a local partner? Um, so I think one is technical, but then the other two is like go to market. Mm -hmm. um, so Africa, you know, it's really nice to talk about it and, and as a monolith because it makes it feel really simple. Um, but it's 54 countries, that, you know, hundreds of languages, different cultural nuances. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to scale, um, you need to be able to sort of meet players where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do a lot on like creatives, like localizing or culturalizing creatives. Mm -hmm. And we find that we'll get 50% higher installs uh, for the same number of impressions by using, let's say, local influencers in our ads mm -hmm. um, or local slang as opposed to even the best kind of shiniest gameplay creatives. Uh, right. So go to market is one, and then uh, payments is, is another right. big challenge. Right. And that's a really interesting one, because um, I think a common sort of refrain that I hear sometimes about Africa is that it's a, a low ARPU market for, for mobile games in particular. right? And, I have to imagine that some of that has, has to do with the fact that some people are putting their game in Google Play, and they're not doing any of the things that you mentioned. There's no local payments. There's no, there's no real localization, and they're discovering that oh, like they're not making very much money from it. So but maybe you could double-click a bit on on the payments piece. Yeah. So 
Payments, I think, is the biggest challenge or monetization overall, which we aim to solve. Um, and so the fundamental challenge is uh, the internationally accepted credit card is, is the sort of form of ubiquitous payment for mobile content. And uh, only one in 10 uh, individuals on the continent have that. Mm. And so the way I describe it is if you have a game and it, it's published in Africa, um, only one out of 10 attempted payers, would-be payers, um, are physically able to do so. And so what we've done is we've built our own payment stack. Um, we've aggregated all of the like relevant local methods, things like mobile money, local mm -hmm. bank transfer, locally denominated cards, mm -hmm. and, um, and created like a very consumer-friendly interface for people to pay for in-game content. And so our hope is that you know, we can convert two or three of those nine people who wanted to pay um, but couldn't. And if you can do that, suddenly you've tripled or quadrupled the LTV mm -hmm. of a game without doing anything else. Mm -hmm. No you UA. Didn't make gameplay changes or anything. It's nothing. Just pure, it's just no. literally allowing people to pay for stuff that they already want to. Right, um, right. Yeah. Super powerful. Yeah. yeah. What are, um, as you look to the future, like, what do you think are some of the greatest sort of opportunities and, and challenges that you guys have before you? So as a company, I would say we're really, really excited about the opportunity. The market opportunity is very clear. Um, our value proposition is also incredibly clear. And so the challenge really is a little bit of this, kind of getting the word out, um, having people understand uh, the, the opportunity. And um, you know, there are a lot of challenges in the world broadly. You know, there are silver linings for us because as you know, things slow down and get more competitive in the West, mm -hmm. as IDFA makes it much harder uh, to go and target whales in the US and China, right. um, we're starting to see some of the biggest game companies kind of change and turn their attention to Africa uh, as, a, as a, a market that has fundamental growth, right? That's 10% right. Uh, every year, just new users. And so, you know, one thing is we, we partnered, um, or we're partnering currently with Activision around Call of Duty Mobile. And I think a year and a half ago, we probably wouldn't have even gotten a phone call with them. Um, <laughs> but um, we're, we're working with them to help them scale in South Africa. And it's, um, it's one of the top grossing mobile games in the world, right? A hundred percent. And so for them to take an interest in the region um, is really great. And what's even better is we've delivered, or even more so, the market has delivered. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, inside of a month of launching, we help them grow their active user base by 7x, um, wow. which is like astonishing. And some of that is just around focus, right? You need to put down a local server so that folks can play in a competitive way. Um, but a lot of it is the nitty gritty stuff on the ground. So uh, we brought on a, uh, an influencer who's a rapper named Nasty C. I had never heard of him because I'm too old, but uh, he's like a he's a he's a Gen Z. Those are the best influencers. So. Exactly. If, if, if you've heard of them, they're probably not the right one. Um, so uh, he's come on and uh, and he's leading the campaign. And so we've done local esports tournament. We had a, a concert uh, tied with it, mm -hmm. and just like created a lot of buzz. And and honestly, people are really excited. The the most comments that we get. So the first most is. South Africans that are really pumped that, that we're doing this. And then the second is Nigerians that are like, like when are we going to get a local server? <laughs> like, what, what's coming next? And so um, there's a really, really like, huge groundswell of appetite for great content. That's awesome. And I think it's never been a better time. I, I think um, uh, it's like the mobile markets in general are just getting more competitive. Right? If you're launching a new app, if you're launching a new game, it's harder than ever to kind of break in the um, the break through the noise and actually attract downloads. And so um, focusing on sort of new greenfield opportunities, like an entire continent of people, I think it's especially powerful these days. 100%. Um, I want to switch gears for a second um, and maybe just talk a bit about company building, because I know you have a lot of founders and builders in the audience as well. Um, but maybe talk a bit about uh, what is it like building a company you know, in a frontier market? Um, it's a carry force is based in, in, in South Africa, right? Okay. It is. Um, I would say it's inspiring and incredibly challenging. So company building 
is, I think, one of the hardest things that you can do, period. Right. Um, I don't have any kids, but I would say it's probably like starting a, a company <laughs> and, and like having your first child. It turns your life upside down. It's really hard. You're trying to build something that's never existed in the world. Um, so it's hard. Uh, building in a frontier market is even harder <laughs> um, because sometimes like capital uh, isn't always there or doesn't yet appreciate the opportunity um, and and sometimes you're you're trying to create new industries like mm -hmm. the free to play gaming industry basically hasn't existed um, at scale in Africa mm -hmm. and so we've had to be pioneers um, so that's the that's the challenge but the opportunity is like yeah, every day uh, you see a massive opportunity, you make a change and you see immediate response from users mm -hmm. and the ecosystem, and um, it's really, really exciting. Um, and so it's interesting, obviously we're, we're here because uh, A16Z is one of our investors, but it would be interesting to kind of hear your, your, your thoughts on frontier market, you know, early stage investing. Sure. Is that, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe we might have been right. off piece or off geo for you guys, but you know, right. eventually it's a good fit. Yeah, so a general sort of investment framework that we have is that um, we believe that every good startup needs to have both a product inside and a distribution inside. Um, and so just to use an example from a company I used to work for, um, Riot Games that made the game League of Legends, but their product insight was that they had found this mod called Dota, and, they just, and their sort of thesis was that if they could reduce barriers to entry, that they could actually unlock an entire genre. And so that was a product insight. And then their distribution insight was they were one of the first sort of Western teams to adopt free-to-play as a business model. Mm -hmm. And that was groundbreaking at the time. And so bringing it back to frontier markets, I think one of the things I love about um, businesses like Carry First that are building in frontier markets is that you have a distribution advantage just by stint of building for a frontier market, right? And so you have a distribution yeah. insight, but you still have to get the product right. So you still got to go with the <laughs> team and build the right product and get the product market fit, which you know, are, are, are challenging things for, for, for every startup. Um, but knowing that if you succeed, you have a huge audience that you're unlocking, I think that's extremely powerful. Um, and I think historically, you're right, like one of the, one of the main challenges of um, startups in frontier markets has been access to labor and access to capital. I think those are the two things that we've noticed. Um, on the labor front, like you often have to get people, uh, if you're recruiting superstar talent you know, from other parts of the world, they have to be willing to move across and you know, relocate to another country, which is a tall, a tall task. Um, and then for investment capital, as a local entrepreneur in an emerging market, like you may not know who the investors are or be able to kind of network your way in to get a warm intro, right? I think the nice thing is that as it was the silver lining of COVID and the pandemic has been that um, now it's easier than ever for people to work remotely and that's become more of a norm. And so the access to labor, I think, is sort of, um, that's become less of an issue because you can just have people work, work wherever they are, but then still, still join a company that's, in the frontier market. Um, and then as talent is dispersed around the globe, I think investors like ourselves have also been increasingly more excited about investing sort of off the beaten path because yeah. you want to invest, we're in the business of investing in the very best founders, wherever they are. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, hopefully that's... Yeah, 100%. Helpful. I mean, we, we've seen exactly that. So 2020 was a really difficult year, but it was probably the seminal year for our company, right? Um, because of COVID, we went from having, you know, three offices and having to recruit in these very limited pools right. to being able to say, wherever you are, as long right. as the time zone works, right. um, we can, you can work with Carrie first. And so um, we're now probably 70 people, but we're in 24 different countries, wow. like across Africa, Europe, <laughs> parts of the Middle East. Um, and it's fun to be able to uh, go to someone in the gaming industry that is obsessed with games. They got into it um, out of passion, but over time they found themselves working for a, a multinational corporation, which is not <laughs> as fun as what they thought it was going to be. Um, and to say like, okay, you can come, you can build games with us, you can market games um, in a new market with a small team and you can still live in Berlin. Or even better, if you hate Berlin and you want to move back to Romania, mm -hmm. you can do that. And like, right. we don't care. Um, right. So remote work has like 
change the game for us uh, with regard to recruiting um, and also fundraising, right? Like, it's a, and people used to be like, uh, you know, when are you going to be in LA next? And then we'd be like, uh, well, actually, I was planning <laughs> on being in LA in three weeks. And then you go on kayak and then <laughs> and book the flight. Um, but now you can just hop on a, on a Zoom call right. and, uh, and connect. So. It, it does make it a lot easier. I feel like company building is, is being democratized in a great way. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great point of the Zoom meetings and um, uh, just the fact that um, you can just you know, hop in the metaverse and essentially pitch, a, pitch an investor in London, pitch an investor in LA, pitch an investor in Berlin and just you know, have those as back-to-back -back Zoom calls. I think that's actually very powerful. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, maybe... Um, when it comes to uh, lessons learned along the way, since it feels like as you've scaled, I'm sure you've had many sort of ups and downs, um, what are some things that looking back you would you know, for sure do again? And, you know, and what are some things that you would maybe try to avoid or the next time around do better on in terms of lessons learned for other, other founders? Yeah. yeah. Um, many, many, many lessons learned. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to distill them down to, to a few. I think um, when I when I talk to founders, I, I, I used to be an investor and and I'm now an entrepreneur. So I still try and mentor other folks a lot. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I say is like, you are your startup, right? Like the idea can change, the market can change, the product can change, but fundamentally. Uh, the founders or the first group of people are your startup. And so the number one is you have to, as I say, like protect the asset, which is you have to take care of yourself physically. Mm. You have to take care of yourself mentally. Like mm. when I first got started, uh, one of the things that I did uh, was I read, I read a few books. I read The Hard Thing About Hard Things, which is yeah. like my startup Bible, definitely read that. Uh, <laughs> but I also read the book about Elon Musk. And you know, he doesn't have a home. He sleeps on his friend's couches. He sleeps on like the floor, shop floor and stuff. And so the first thing I did, I like went to New York. I was sleeping on my friend's couch. I like wasn't eating. Uh, and, mm. and that was idiotic, mm. right? The, the first thing you should do is just make sure that you're taking care of yourself, that you're in the right frame of mind because it's a marathon. Um, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, it is yeah. not a sprint. Um, second thing is get help, right? I have been right. fortunate to get uh, to have two co-founders that are way better than me uh, at certain things, um, and that where we have like good chemistry. And there's so much to do, and it's so hard that I think getting great help is the second thing. And and I think the third is really like having fun. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's like, I think, a mantra for work generally. Um, e even if you, know, you only work exactly 40 hours a week and I, you refuse I, to spend an, another hour, you're still going to be spending the majority of like, your waking, you know, non-sleeping, non-toothbrushing or commuting right. hours at work. Um, so you may as well have fun. And if you're going to do something for 10 years and try and change the world, like you better have fun. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to be a miserable ride. Um, so none of those have to do with like product market fit or engineering <laughs> tactics or anything. Yeah. But I think if you if you apply those, you know, you have a chance, and that's right. all you can ask for, really. Yeah. There's um. Uh, it's interesting how the media sometimes glamorizes startup life and um, what you were saying earlier about sleeping in couches and sort of like you know being a garage like a garage startup. <laughs> it's glamorized, but I think the reality is that startups are about as much about just the long game of just like lasting and surviving essentially until you find product market fit. And um, so I think focusing on making sure that you have sustainable lifestyle practices. I think that's. We don't hear a lot about that, but I think that's incredibly important because um, you gotta, you gotta be able to hang in there. And maybe your first product doesn't work, and you need to like iterate and try something else. Um, and then the you know, these fundraising processes can can sometimes take a long time. <laughs> and there, um, it's a lot about just persevering, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, this has been great. Um, any last thoughts on? Carry first Africa or any, any advice that you have for other entrepreneurs out there that are building frontier markets? Yeah. 
Look, I would say for, for entrepreneurs generally, um, just keep at it, right? Yeah. Maintain your vision. Don't lose sight of why you started in the first place and keep going. Um, and then generally, I would say, um, you know, Africa is a really, really exciting market. It's worth your time. Um, if you're interested in scaling in the region, definitely reach out to us. And uh, we'd love to continue the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Cordell. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Sean. Yeah.